right, good morning, church family. We're so excited that you're with us this morning. We're here to worship the Lord. There's freedom in God's house. There's freedom in your house. Let's all stand no matter where we are together. Let's join together in some song and some worship. Amen. To the wild, and don't be afraid. Run into wide open spaces, races waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, races waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Lord is there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be freedom, let there be freedom. Bring on. Bring all of your scars. Come back to communion. Come back to the star. Run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted, graces waiting. Let's all sing this out together at home. We're all gathered as one. Many homes 
many places, but let's sing this out as one church. Come on. And people come together, the strangest neighbors, but is one. The children of every generation, of every nation.
Hallelujah. Just put your hands together. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Yes. His name is Jesus. When we say that name, all confidence comes to your life and the situation. We're so glad to be with you again this morning. In just a moment, Pastor Ryan, our Connections pastor, is going to bring the message for today. And I just want you to know, here we are. We're still, this is our eighth week, COVID-19, meeting together with really no one here in the church building, but we're meeting together in various places as the Church of Jesus Christ, and hopefully not that much longer, and we'll be back together. And that's what we're believing for and hoping for and praying for. But I just get a picture as we're singing that song this morning. Thy great God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, it tells us in Scripture that he said, all authority has been given unto me. All things are under his feet. And that means he has all authority, not just power. Satan has power, but not all authority. And our Savior, Jesus Christ, he has delegated that authority to his church, you and me. And so I want us to know today that our God is not pacing the halls of heaven, wringing his hands and scratching his head. He rules and he reigns in majesty and power. He is in full control. He has a plan. I believe it's a pivotal plan. It's time for us, the church, to refocus, to repent, and to move forward in what God has for us in the next season. This isn't a waste of time. God's going to use this. So don't allow fear, don't allow uncertainties to overwhelm your life right now. Our God has all authority. Amen? He has all authority. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord for your presence, for your power, and your authority. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for bringing your church together. Thank you, Lord, for people coming back to you. Thank you for those that are wayward, repenting, coming back to you. Thank you, those that are lukewarm, coming back to you. Thank you for the backslider coming back to you. Thank you for your church recognizing you as Lord and Savior. We thank you for today, the word that Pastor Ryan's going to bring. We open our hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Good morning, Morningstar. We are glad that you are joining us this morning as we continue to gather online. We are going to continue our worship with our tithe and offerings. And here at Morningstar Fellowship, we give to the Lord cheerfully. And there are four different ways that you can give. You can either give by sending uh, your money in the, in the mail. Uh, you can uh, give online through our website or our app. Or you can text the word GIVE to the number below. Just as a reminder, we are doing, we are going to start doing Pennsburg work days starting next Tuesday. If you are interested, please sign up online. Starting next week, we're going to be starting an eight-week series called House of Cards. And during this eight-week series, we're going to be talking about marriage and, and focusing on the family and what God calls us uh, to live like as a family and within our marriages. And during this eight-week series, we are also going to start virtual connect groups. And they're going to look a little bit different than what they are uh, in previous time. Uh, but we encourage you to sign up. During these virtual connect times, there are going to be sermon-based uh, groups that will be meeting in regards to the eight-week sermon. Uh, but there will be other groups on topical conversations within the Bible uh, that will be taking place as well. For more information or to sign up for one of these connect groups, please visit our website website or on the app. Here's Mari with some information regarding Mother's Day service. Ladies, Mother's Day is almost upon us. And gentlemen, don't tune out because we need you to do something too. We have lots of fun events planned, but in order to make those happen, ladies, you need to check your email. There's a survey we want you to fill out so we can get lots of fun answers from you. Gentlemen, check your email. We need you to film the kids and send it back in so we can make a cute video for the moms. For the actual day on May 10th, join us 15 minutes early for a little bit of fun 
And then we want you to stick around after the service. We're gonna have a live panel of moms and we're gonna ask them some questions. We're gonna figure out how they're getting through this time. A little humor, a little biblical help. It's gonna be wonderful. So mark your calendars, join us 15 minutes early on May 10th, and then we're gonna take a little break. You can go and get more coffee, make sure the kids are gone. Yes, dads, that's your job to get the kids gone. And then spend about a half an hour with us as we just dig into the word and be moms together. Hope to see you there May 10th. Just as a reminder for kids ministry, there is still registration for Mega Sports Camp. Also as well, we are still in need of volunteers during the Mega Sports Camp. More details will come out as we continue to gauge uh, with transition of reopening and everything like that. But at this time, tentatively, Mega Sports Camp is still on. We encourage you to sign up your kids and if you are interested in volunteering, please sign up as well. Now here's Ryan in our final segment in The Good Life. Hey, good morning, Morning Star family. Thanks for joining us online. Still getting used to this. We had some technical difficulties this morning going on, but we're so glad that you're here with us online today. As Pastor Mike said in the announcements, we're in the third and final week of a series we're calling The Good Life. If you haven't been here over the last few weeks with us online, what we've been doing throughout the series is we've been talking about what does it look like to live out the abundant life that God has created and desires for us to live. And so Pastor Mike, the first week, talked about our identity, how important it is to understand who we are. And the big idea during that first week is, is that as followers of Christ, we are in Christ. I, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that. It was full of biblical information that's going to encourage you and challenge you to understand who you are. Because until you know who you are, it's impossible to know what God has called you to do. That's what we talked about the second week. Pastor John last week talked about our purpose. What is our purpose as those who are in Christ? And we really came to this idea that it's about a radical commitment to Jesus and to his kingdom. And so we talked about this. If you join us on Facebook every morning at 8 a.m., we continued this idea throughout the week. What does it look like to have this radical commitment to Jesus? Now, as we wrap up the series this morning, we're gonna be taking this and going real practical. How do we actually live this out? How do we walk this out? What does it look like to walk out the good life every single day of our lives? We know our identity, we know our purpose, but this is here where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. How do we actually live this out every single day of our lives? And so let me just ask you a question I want you to think about wherever you're at right now. Uh, what, and this question is, is kind of personal to me, if I'm being honest with you, but there is times that I've experienced this in my own life, and maybe you've experienced it. Well, how many of you would say that in your own life, there has been times where you felt like it was impossible to live the life that God called you to live? It's impossible for you to live the life. I mean, you know God's standards. You know what God wants. You read the word of God. You know what he expects or how he wants for us to experience this life. But then you look at yourself in the mirror and you realize the flaws and the imperfections that you have. I mean, you know yourself better than anybody else. And you look at yourself in the mirror and you go, I just, I just don't think that I can do it. I just don't think I have what it takes. I, I want to live a life that honors God. I want to live a life that serves him, but I just don't think that I'm able to do it. I just don't think that I can actually make that happen. Come on, how many of you would be honest and say that you've ever felt the weight of that burden, the weight of the burden of living the life that God has called you? Well, I, I have good news for you today. I just want to encourage you as we begin this morning that you were never meant to carry the weight of that burden. You were never meant to carry the weight of that burden. In fact, Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 11, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden that I give you is light. Let me just say this. It is impossible to live the life that God has called you to live in your own power and through your own strength. You don't have what it takes. It's like trying to sail a ship on dry ground. It never will work. You can't walk this walk in your own power through your own strength. The weight and the burden is simply too heavy for you to bear. That's why Jesus offers us something different. He says, carry my yoke. Carry the yoke with me. Why? Because the yoke is easy and the burden 
is like, now I don't know if you've ever really thought about that idea of what Jesus is saying there. And I think it's really easy for us to kind of just pass by this idea because, let's be real, like we don't, we don't really see a lot of yokes. We don't really understand the, the terminology, so to speak. But this is a term that the, the, the people that Jesus was speaking to at the time would have been very familiar with. A uh, yoke is a, a farming term. It's a tool that is used. Now, we, you know, when we see farmers nowadays, they drive tractors and they have all this big equipment to do the job. But back in that day, they didn't have those same things available to them. And so a yoke was a, a wooden cross piece. I'm going to put some, we're going to have them put some pictures up on the screen if they're not already, so you can kind of get an idea of what this might have looked like. But a yoke was a, a wooden cross piece that was fastened over the necks of two animals, usually bulls or oxen. And it was attached to a plow or a cart, to, and it was often used to, to help when it came to plowing the fields. And essentially what a yoke would do is it would allow two animals to share the load and to pull together to get the job done. And so Jesus is speaking about this kind of term, and he's kind of painting a visual picture of what he's offering to us when it comes to following him. See, some of us, we have a misunderstanding of what it means when it comes to following Jesus. Maybe you understand what we talked about the first week. You understand your identity. You understand what Jesus says about you. You understand that he saves us. He makes us a new creation. You got that part. And maybe you understand that there's a purpose that he wants for your life. You understand that there's a new purpose as a follower of Christ, as somebody who's in Christ. But here's the thing we need to understand. God does not expect us to kind of figure it out from that point on our own. Like, let me give you an example. How many of you have kids? If you have kids, right, how many of you, when your kids were born, at the moment they were born, you said to them, all right, figure it out on your own, baby, right? Like, figure it out on your own. All right, I did my job. I birthed you. I brought you into this world. Now, you got to figure out how to feed yourself on your own, figure out how to get dressed on your own, get a job, pay for your own clothing, right? Uh, teach yourself how to walk. Teach yourself how to ride a bike. You figure it out. I did my job. I brought you into this, but it's your part to figure the rest of this out. No, that's, that's terrible parenting, right? That would be a terrible job. Why? Because we understand that birth is only the beginning, there's a, a lifetime of learning that's involved after that. And the same is true with Jesus. It's not like Jesus saves us, makes us a new creation, and then says, listen, I want you to live a life that honors me. I want you to live a life that brings glory to me. You need to figure it out on your own. Figure out how that's going to work. Figure out how to make that possible. Jesus doesn't do that. That's why Jesus is saying, take my yoke and learn from me. You know, when training a, a new animal, such as an oxen, uh, ancient farmers, they would, when it came to the yoke, they would often yoke this, this younger bull to an older, stronger, more experienced animal who would bear the weight of the burden and who would guide the young animal through the learning process. Because if not, they would never understand what they would do. Or the weight of the burden would be just too much and they would just stubbornly just kind of sit there. So they would, because they knew that, yoke it or connect it to an older, more experienced one who would lead them and teach them through experience. And so what Jesus is saying here is he's inviting us to be yoked and connected to him, saying my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you know why his yoke is easy and his burden is light? Because he bears it with us. He bears it with us. When we try and bear it alone, it is absolutely unbearable. Come on, we've all felt that. When we try to carry the weight ourselves, it is absolutely unbearable. But when Jesus is with us, it can be easy in life because he's the one who's ultimately doing the heavy lifting. He's the one leading. We simply choose to submit, to trust, and to obey. And for some of us, we really struggle with this because if we're honest, we're kind of control freaks. Come on, how many of you, you know, like if you're sitting next to your spouse on the couch today, you know this to be true about the control freaks, right? Like we like to feel like we're in control. And for some of us, the reason that this season, I know in my life, the reason that this season is so difficult is because it feels like everything is out of my control. Everything in life right now is out of control. And even though we're really never in control anyway, we kind of feel like we're in control at times. And right now we don't feel like we're in any control. And so the reason we struggle with this is because we're control freaks. Let me give you an example. My wife, she's a pretty good driver. Like, she's, she's, a, she's a good driver. She's very careful. I don't know if she's ever been pulled over. I don't think she's ever had a speeding ticket. I don't think she breaks the law when she drives, right? I don't think she, she's ever had an accident or anything like that when it comes to driving. But if I'm honest with you, I hate when she drives. Like, I, I absolutely hate being in the car. I'll tell you, I'll take it a step further. If she's driving in the car in front of me, I don't like that either. If she's driving in the car behind me, I don't like that either. Why? Because I am a terrible passenger seat driver. Come on, how many of you know somebody that's just a terrible passenger street driver? When Tiffany's driving, even if she's driving from our parking lot here to get my car in the other parking lot over across the road, I have a, a habit of offering some unsolicited 
advice about how she can be a better driver like me, right? Remember, I want 90 miles per hour with the thing on my minivan. I'm an excellent driver, okay? I, I, I offer her my unsolicited advice, and so she'll be driving. I'll say, hey, can you, you think you can go a little faster? Can you get, get in the right lane? You need to be in the right lane. Get in the left lane. You need to be in the left lane. Hey, can you pass that person? They're obviously 400 years old, right? They're going 30 miles per hour. You need to pass that person. And so I offer her all my advice the whole time about how she can become a better driver. A better a driver. So what she understands is it's just easier at this point to let me drive and a lot less annoying, right? It's a lot less annoying to simply let me drive so she doesn't have to hear my advice. And I think we do the same thing sometimes when it comes to God. We, we, we become followers of Christ. He's in, our, he's in our lives. He says, listen, you've, you've had the steering wheel up until this point in your life. You've done a pretty terrible job. Let me have the wheel. Let me drive the car. Let me lead your life. And we do the same thing to God, well, God, I don't think you're leading fast enough. <laughs> I don't think you're going fast enough. I don't think, I think you missed your turn, God. I think my life was supposed to go that direction. Listen, I'm going to let you in charge, but I'm going to offer you my advice all the time on how you should be leading my life. But ultimately, God wants to be in control. He wants to get us to the place where we simply trust him. We submit to his leading and not only submit to it, but we actually obey what he says. We actually do what he says. Now, some of you might be thinking in this context, Following Jesus sounds a lot like being a slave. Following Jesus sounds a lot like slavery. It doesn't really sound like, when you think of a yoke, it, it probably, maybe it sounds a little bit like slavery. It doesn't really sound like freedom. And I would simply say to you this morning, well, all of us are yoked to something. All of us are yoked and connected to something. The question isn't, are you yoked to something? The question is, to whom or to what do you want to be Yoke. To whom or to what do you want to allow to lead and guide your lives? Let me give you a couple examples of what we often experience the yoke of in our lives. One of these is the, the yoke of sin. The Bible says that when we live lives of sin, we're not free, we're actually slaves. Some of you, when you see people living lives of sin, you think, man, they're just experiencing freedom. They do whatever they want. They live however they want. They have no rules. They can do it, but that's actually not freedom at all. In fact, the Bible says, Jesus said this in John chapter 8, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. Or in Romans chapter 6, Paul says it like this, don't you realize that you become a slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching that we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawlessness, which led even deeper into sin. Now, you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living so that you will become holy. For some of us, this is the reality of the yoke that we live under in this life. Every single one of you who is a follower of Christ, this was your reality before you knew Jesus. You walked under that yoke of, of sin. How many of you remember that yoke of sin, that yoke of, of shame that you experienced in, in your life, that yoke of, of temporary pleasure that never actually gave you what it promised, that yoke of, of going from temporary happiness to temporary happiness but never actually finding joy? That's the yoke and the weight of sin. You know, when I think of the yoke uh, that we put up on the picture earlier, I think of, when it comes to the yoke of sin, I think of a, of a bull or an oxen that's yoked to like a donkey or a mule. Those two animals are not made to go together, right? They're not made to go together. And what ends up happening is when animals would do that, when they were unequally yoked in that way, that, that donkey or that mule would, would be stubborn. It would just kind of sit there and hold them back or it would kind of go off in its own direction all the time. And when I think of the yoke of sin in our lives, I kind of think it's like that. We're trying to go a certain direction. We're trying maybe to do the right thing, but there's constantly these distractions that are pulling us off course. There's constantly these distractions that are trying to get us to mess up. It's like a st the stubbornness of sin. It's a yoke in a way that we carry outside of that yoke that Jesus wants us to carry. But it's not the only yoke. It's not just the yoke of sin. Another yoke that we often connect ourselves with is that yoke of religion. Religion is simply man's attempt to get to God on our own terms. It's self-righteousness. It's all about following the rules, not in response to what Jesus has done for you, but to get God to love us and accept us, and it's impossible to do on our own. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says this, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law, 
For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says this, God saved you by grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast about it. You know, just like sin is a yoke that, that keeps us from living the good life that God has called us to live, religion is a yoke that robs us from experiencing the abundant life that God has for us. When I think of the yoke of religion, I think about this visual picture of the yoke of religion. I think about this yoke that is made to be carried by us and by Jesus leading the way. And instead of allowing Jesus to lead the way, we choose to say, okay, Jesus, I got it from here. I'll wear this yoke myself. I think I can carry the weight of this burden on my own. I think I can do it on my own. I'm a strong. I'm strong in myself. I'm really good at following the rules. I can do it on my own. And so we carry this yoke. We kind of say, Jesus, you step off to the side. I'll do my thing. I get this. I'll get to God on my own. And as we carry this yoke, it's like dragging. It's, it's weighing us down. It's pulling us. It's getting stuck in the mud. It's impossible to lead. We're carrying a weight that we weren't made to carry on our own. And Jesus says to us, listen, I don't want you to carry that weight of being yoked to sin. Why? Because he became that sin and he carried that shame so we would never have to. He says, I don't want you to be weighed down by the yoke of religion. Why? Because he lived the perfect life. Because he knew that you would never be able to live that perfect life and get to God on your own. You don't have to live in shame anymore. You don't have to be constantly pulled in all different directions. You don't have to run to temporary happiness. You, you, God wants you to experience his joy. You don't have to keep going in endless cycles of religious obligation, trying to earn God's favor. Instead of the bondage of sin, the yoke of sin, the yoke of religion, Jesus offers us something different. He offers us the yoke of relationship. He offers us the yoke of relationship. That's what Jesus is saying in this portion of scripture. He's saying, take my yoke and learn from me. Walk with me. Let me lead you into the good life that I have planned for you. Is it always gonna be easy? No. It's not always gonna be easy. But he says the reason it can be easy and, easy and the burden can be light is because even during those difficult things, as long as you're yoked and connected to Jesus, he's going to carry the brunt of the weight. He's going to carry you through whatever that situation is that you're going through. Or I like how the Apostle Paul explains this Christian life in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, my old self has been crucified with Christ and is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave her, himself up for me. When we're in Christ, we've put our faith in him. The Bible says we're no longer living under our power. It's no longer about you or I living this out. It's about allowing Christ to live it out in and through us. That's what walking the good life is all about. And here's the crazy thing. We don't do it ourselves. Jesus promised us something that is so vital to our lives as followers of Christ. He says, I'm going to give you somebody that's going to help you walk it out. I'm going to give you somebody that's going to help you understand how to live the good life. It's the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 14, Jesus said these words in verse 15 through 17. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. Jesus says, look, if you love me, you'll follow my commands. You'll do what I say to do. But don't worry. I know that you can't do that on your own. I know that you're gonna fall short. I know that you might even forget what I've told you to do. So I'm gonna give you a helper, a personal assistant who's going to be with you always, who's gonna constantly walk with you, who's gonna constantly lead you, who's gonna constantly remind you of the things I've told you to do. You don't have to do it on your own. I'm sending you a helper who's going to lead you. That's what we talk about when it comes to walking out this good life. It's walking in the spirit. And so I wanna focus on our main portion of scripture today in Galatians chapter five, verse 16 through 25 because this paints a picture of what this looks like practically to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us and also what it looks like when we're not walking under the Spirit's leading in our lives. And so Galatians chapter five, verse 16 through 25 says this. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. For the sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other so that you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, 
you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. I want us to see something here. Paul's saying there's a, there's a war that is constantly going on in our lives, even after we've submitted to Jesus, even after we've given our lives to Christ, even after we put our trust in him. How many of you know what I'm talking about? There's that war that continues to go on in your lives. Some of you have been following Jesus for a long time, and you think, man, I shouldn't be dealing with this temptation. I shouldn't be dealing with this frustration. I should be past all that. The reality is we deal with this sin in this world. We experience temptation. We still feel the pull sometimes in our lives to put back on that yoke of sin or to put back on that yoke of religion because we live in a broken world that is not the way that God created it or intended it to be. And because we live in that broken world, the flesh is still at war with our spirit. It ta Paul talks about this in even more detail in, in Romans chapter 7 where he says, I don't do the things I want to do and the things I, I, I want to do, I don't do and the things I don't want to do or the things that I do. It's this constant war between our spirit wanting to live for God and the flesh that is tempting us and pulling us towards sin. And so what Paul is encouraging us in the very beginning of this portion of scripture is saying you have to choose to let the Holy Spirit lead you every single day, every single step of the way because if you don't, this is what's gonna happen. Verse 19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living, another version says practicing that sort of life, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul's saying when we don't follow the Spirit's leading in our lives, when we pick up that old yoke of sin, when we pick up that old yoke of religion, this is what ends up happening. This is the fruit of that. This is what our life will look like. Anytime we're not walking in the Spirit's leading, we're walking in the flesh or in religion. Those are our three choices. Anytime we're not living by the Spirit's leading, we're putting back on the yoke of the flesh or the yoke of religion. And when we do that, the fruit of our lives is never really good. Come on, that's not like a list that we should be attaining to, right? That's a list that we should be trying to stay away from. And Paul says that anyone living or practicing this type of life cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, let me just say this. He's not saying that you're never going to mess up, you're never going to fall short. Because we all know that in our lives we sin at times. What he's saying is if you look at your life and you see these type of sins and you see this fruit in your life, you know that at that time you are not walking by the Spirit's leading, but you're walking under the yoke of something else. And so you need to change course. So the idea isn't that a Christian could never do any of these sins. Right? The idea is that a Christian could never, is never capable of struggling with any of these fleshly sins that we read here. But a follower of Christ, somebody who is truly in Christ, will never stay in these sins. They'll never continue to practice or walk out these sins. I like how Charles Spurgeon said it. He said, the grace that does not change my life will not save my soul. In other words, if you're in Christ, your life should look different than it did before you knew Jesus, right? Your life should look different. If you look exactly the same way, if you act the same way that you did before you knew Jesus, right, then I would say that that grace has not really changed your life. If that grace has not changed your life, then that grace is not going to change or, or save your soul. That's what Charles Spurgeon is saying here. Your life should look different than it did before. It's not that you're never going to mess up, but you won't stay in that prison. You won't continue. The Holy Spirit, because he's in us and he's with us, one of his jobs is to convict us of sin. And so when we're walking and, and we take off that yoke of a relationship with Jesus and we put on that yoke of sin or that yoke of religion again, the Holy Spirit is there to convict us and say, hey, listen, you're off course. You're going the wrong direction. You're allowing the wrong thing to lead you at this point. And instead of continuing to practice and live in that sin, somebody who is a follower of Christ, who is in Christ, will be quick to repent. God, I'm sorry. And take off that yoke of sin, take off that yoke, that, that prison that you're in that you were never made to carry anymore and quickly put back on the yoke of relationship because you don't want to stay there. Why? Because we want our lives to produce the right type of fruit. Ultimately, that's what we want as far as of Christ. We want our life to produce the right type of fruit. We want to work to, to, to allow the Holy Spirit to lead us so we're not producing the wrong type of fruit in our lives. What does that right type of fruit look like? Look at verse 22. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. 
Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. If you're walking the good life, if you're experiencing the good life, if you're going to walk in yoke with Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, your life is going to produce certain fruit as you submit to the Holy Spirit's leading. He says you're going to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I want you to understand that you never produce those things in your own power. You only produce those things when the Holy Spirit is guiding you and working in and through your life. Anytime your life is not producing those fruit, it means you're not walking in step with the Spirit. And I love that last verse. It says, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. In other words, if we're in Christ, the Bible says we have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit. But we still have to choose to follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. He says, since you're living in the Spirit, you have the Spirit, choose to follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. There's a daily step-by-step choice we make to submit to his leading and obey his commands. And so as we close this morning, I want to look at three things walking in the Spirit entails. If you're going to walk out this good life, if you're going to experience this good life every single day, walking under Jesus' yoke, walking under, under following him, what is this actually going to look like in your life? Number one, three things walking in the Spirit entails. It, it entails a focused direction. Walking in the Spirit is not aimless or directionless walking. It's focused. It's living with the mindset that's set on eternal things. It's not just living for the here and now. It's a mindset of saying, I'm living for eternity. I think an easy way to know if you're really living this way and walking under that yoke of leadership of the Holy Spirit is to simply look at your life and say, is the path that I'm walking ultimately bringing glory to God and bringing me closer to him? Is the path I'm walking, is the decisions that I'm making right now, are they ultimately bringing glory to God and leading me closer to him? If not, change direction. We choose to get back under the leadership because our direction is wrong. Or I like how Paul says it in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. In other words, I have not arrived. I've not arrived. This isn't finished. I'm not a finished product. He says, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Then in verse 18, it says, For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct, the way that they live their life, shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. In other words, their direction is wrong. The direction they're going shows that they are not truly walking in unison with the Holy Spirit, in step with the Holy Spirit. Their God is their appetite. That's not just talking about food. That's talking about the things that we desire, the fleshly desires that we often have. They brag about shameful things. Come on, how many of you ever know anybody that says, look, I got the grace of God. I can do what I want. That is not actually true. They brag about shameful things. And they only think about this life here on earth. Verse 20, but we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives and we eagerly are awaiting for him to return as our savior. Come on, walking in the spirit involves focused direction. I'm not gonna focus on my past. I'm not gonna focus on my failures. I'm not gonna be distracted by, by chasing after temporary earthly desires and pleasures or temporary things. I'm focused on what lies ahead. I'm pressing on towards the price. I'm not there yet, but my mind is set on the right things. My mind is set on eternal things. I'm not gonna choose to put on that old yoke of sin. I'm not gonna choose to put on that old empty yoke of religion. I'm gonna continue to walk step by step seeking after eternal things. I like how C.S. Lewis said, he said, all that is not eternally, or excuse me, all that is not eternal is eternally useless. All that is not eternal is eternally useless. Walking in the Spirit takes focused direction, is where I'm going, ultimately bringing glory to God and drawing me closer to Him. If not, then I'm heading the wrong way, and I'm going to choose to stop, repent, and get back in line with the Holy Spirit's leading in my life. The second thing walking in the Spirit entails is unrelenting dedication. Focused direction and then unrelenting dedication. There are going to be days where it feels easier to just give up. Come on, how many of you ever had one of those days? 
Maybe you've had some of those days during this whole quarantine. Maybe you're homeschooling your kids, and you never signed up to be a homeschooler, and you're hoping they have a different teacher next year. And you're tired, and you're worn out, and you feel like giving up. Come on, there's days where we feel like we just want to throw in the towel. I'm done. I can't walk in step with the Spirit anymore. I can't keep following. It'd just be easier to put on the old yoke of something else because this yoke is not easy for me to do. Why in those moments? It's because we're walking in our own power and in our strength. Walking in the Spirit, though, it requires an unrelenting dedication. It's action. Walking is movement. It's continuous. And just like we constantly have to be filled with the Holy Spirit's power in our lives, our walk in the Spirit is also ongoing. So we have to maintain our dedication. We have to continue to walk no matter what gets in our way. We're in the book of James, chapter 1, it says this. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. When most of us deal with obstacles and things in our lives, we don't really look at it as an opportunity for anything but pain. He says, consider it an opportunity for joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And then in verse 12, it says this, God blesses those who patiently endure testing, who continue to walk this out during testing and temptation. Afterwards, after you continue to walk, after you continue to have dedication and press on, you receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Listen, our walk in Christ is strengthened, not by the easy times, but during the difficult seasons, when we continue to press on, when we continue to stay connected to Jesus, when we continue to allow him to lead us, when we experience him carrying the weight during that time. Our faith is tested, our walk is strengthened, not during the easy times, but as we continue to press on and go the direction that God has called us to live in the difficult seasons. So it takes focused direction, unrelenting dedication, and the third thing walking in the Spirit requires is total dependency. It involves total dependency, and this is probably the most important, and which brings us back to this understanding of yoke that we've been talking about throughout this whole time. It's about constantly reminding ourselves that we cannot do this in our own power. The key to walking in the Spirit is to look to Jesus continuously to give us the ability to do what we know we can't do on our own to give us the ability to do what we know we are incapable of doing on our own. Anytime, I mean the moment that we actually try to do this in our own power, in our own strength, the moment that we start living in our own power, in our own strength, is the moment that we reject the work of the Spirit in our lives. You cannot put on both of those yokes at the same time. We need to trust the Holy Spirit. We need total dependency. And Jesus paints this picture in John chapter 15, maybe a portion of Scripture that you're very familiar with. It says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, what? You can do nothing. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Stay connected to me. Keep that yoke on. Let me continue to walk with you. Let me continue to lead you. Let me continue to guide you because you cannot do what I'm calling you to do in your own power and strength. You'll never live a life that pleases God in your own power, in your own strength. You're not capable of doing it. So he says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. Those who remain in me will produce much fruit, will produce that right type of fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to daily remind ourselves that I cannot do this on my own. I'm not made to do this on my own. God has not left me to figure this out on my own. He's promised me the Holy Spirit, and he promised me if I would submit to his leading and obey him, he will lead me, and he will produce the right type of fruit in my life. As we close this morning, Maybe you're listening right now wherever you're at. Maybe somebody shared this post and you just kind of happened to, to click on it. Maybe you've been coming, been a part of Morningstar for a long time. And you look at your life and maybe if you look at your life right now, you realize that you're carrying that weight of a yoke of sin. You look at your life and you realize that it's just full of, of shame and regret. Maybe you feel like you're just walking in circles Maybe you feel like you're not even going anywhere. You're just kind of on that treadmill of life and you're walking, but you're not getting anywhere. You're not getting anywhere because you're not connected to Jesus. And maybe you feel that there's no hope. Jesus would offer you his yoke today, a yoke of relationship. 
Not a heavy yoke, not an unbearable yoke, but a yoke of relationship, a promise to lead you and guide you. You were never meant to carry this weight of sin that you're carrying. You were never made to, made to feel the bondage of the sin and the weight of that shame that you're carrying. Jesus became that sin for you. He paid the price for that shame for you so you would never have to carry the weight of that. And he offers you the, the yoke of relationship. Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Not I will add to your burden. Not, not I will make the burden heavier. He says, no, I will give you rest. Take my yoke and learn from me, for I am humble and gentle, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden that I give you is light. If you're listening right now, and maybe you're carrying that weight of sin, and that sin has identified your life and has been what you've run to, that addiction that you continually run to, that habit that you continually run to, can I just tell you this morning that Jesus has paid the price so you never have to be in bondage to that anymore? And if you're listening today, man, I don't want to tell you, I don't want you to repeat after me, I don't want you to pray, there's no magic words that you pray right now, but you simply invite him into your life to be your Lord and to be your Savior. God, my life is yours. I submit to you, I want you to change my life. If you want me, if you'll take me, if you'll forgive me, if you paid the price for this sin that I'm walking in bondage under, then I, I want to give it to you. I don't ever want to walk under that bondage of sin again. And you simply submit that to God. You surrender that to him. You give your life to him and say, God, from this day forward, I'm not picking up that yoke anymore. I'm going to continue to put on the yoke of relationship. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to allow you to lead me and guide me. Just pray that prayer as we close today. Invite him into your life. Give him your sin. Give him everything, that shame and everything else, and allow him to replace that with his righteousness and the relationship that he wants you to experience. Now, maybe that's not your yoke today. Maybe it's that yoke of religion that you carry, that you continue to carry. Maybe you know that Jesus wants to have a relationship with you, but you find yourself continuing to try to earn it, continuing to try to feel like you're a failure, continuing to feel like you never could be good enough, continuing to put on that old yoke of, of religion when Jesus wants you to have a yoke of relationship with him, trying harder, feeling like a failure. Can I be honest that that, that yoke is just as heavy and it's a yoke that the, the, the Holy Spirit does not want you to live under or experience just like the yoke of sin. It's so easy if we're honest at times to pick up these yokes, right? It's so easy even as followers of Christ to at times be tempted to pick up that yoke of sin, that yoke of religion. But we have to constantly remind ourselves is anytime we pick up that yoke, we can't at the same time carry the yoke that Jesus offers. And every yoke that we pick up other than the yoke that Jesus offers is a heavy and weary and burdensome yoke. But the yoke that Jesus wants to offer us, the yoke of walking with us, the yoke of relationship, is easy and it's light. Not because it's easy in our own, but because Jesus carries the weight for us. And so if you're listening today and you are a follower of Christ, but maybe you look at your life and you see that you've continued to pick up other yokes, you've continued to go back under that power, I would just encourage you today as we end in worship to simply surrender to God. God, I'm not trusting religion. I can never, if religion, if it was possible to get to God based on your own religious, guess what? Jesus died for nothing. And it's not possible, it's impossible. That's why Jesus did for you what you could never do for yourself. So just worship him today. Give that yoke back to him. God, I'm, I'm putting myself out under your leading. I'm going to allow the Holy Spirit to lead me this week. Step by step, day by day, I'm going to follow his leading and do what he's calling me to do. And I'm going to have my eyes set on the right prize. I'm going to have direction. I'm going to have dedication. And I'm never going to stop relying on Jesus because I cannot do it on my own. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that you have a life that you want us to experience, a good life, an abundant life. Lord, I pray today for anybody who's listening right now who's maybe living under that power of sin, who feels lost and hopeless. God, I pray right now they would feel your tug in their heart, not my words, but your words and your love reaching out to them, your forgiveness, taking that shame that they've experienced in their lives. Lord, doing something in their life that they could never do. Lord, I thank you that your words as you became sin for us and we exchange that sin for the righteousness, for right standing with God. Lord, we give our lives to you today. Lord, for those times that we continue to go back to that broken system of religion, trying to earn your favor, God, we repent and we turn back to you. Lord, I thank you that we can never get to you on our own, so you did everything by sending Jesus to us. He lived the perfect life that we could not live, and he died the death that we deserve to die. 
Lord, today we worship you. We thank you, Jesus, for loving us. We thank you, Jesus, for guiding us. We thank you that you have not left us to figure this out on our own, but you promised to lead us and to bear fruit in and through our lives. And so we thank you, Lord. We worship you today because it's all about you and what you want to do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.